This is VJ with another Black Inspirational Spotlight. Today we have two-time Super Bowl champ and now ESPN football analyst, Mr. Damian Woody. Now we did have some technical difficulties to start, so it may jump to the middle of the interview, but enjoy. So yeah, so you were mentioning that, um, you know, throughout your career you had some some luck being able to stick it out um, and, and, you know, not get injured too many times um, and, and you were able to make it through. Now, being on being on TV now, what kind of preparation goes into that? I mean, it's it's definitely different from being on the field and being, you know, having to play. Well, a lot of people think, you know, because I played, you know, played in the NFL that it's, you know, it's easy to talk about that on TV and it's and it's not. You, there's a lot of preparation that goes into it, you know, because when you play, man, a lot of times you only focus on the team that's in your division. You don't really have to learn the whole league. Whereas now I have to I have to know the whole league, all the teams. I got to do all the preparation. Right. You know, um, at ESPN, man, we got such a great support staff to give you all the information, stats, all the things that you need to help you become successful. But at the end of the day, man, you got to put in the work. You got to right. be the one that you know got to be your own harshest critic when you're on TV. You got to study yourself when you're on TV so you can become better. I mean, that's just like anything that we do out here. Um, I call it self-scouting. So yeah. you got to self-scout. And listen, there's been some some big names that's gone on TV and flamed out because they don't put in the work. They just think that, oh, well, I'm a Hall of Famer and this is going to come easy. And it, that, that's not the case. Right. Um, so you got to put in the work, man. And fortunately for me, you know, I've gotten better and better every year. And I'm, you know, I'm going into year nine now of my TV career. Yeah, that that's awesome. And it's, it sounds almost as if you were preparing for your playbook or something like that. Oh, yeah, absolutely, man. Listen, I always said, man, if you don't, if you don't prepare now for where you want to be, then you've already lost. So yeah. again, I, I started preparing during my, you know, during my career, a lot of guys, what they tend to do is, they wait until their career over, and then they want to try to start preparing. And it just doesn't work that way. Right. You know, you got to prepare, you know, for anybody that play that plays in a league, whether it's NFL, NBA, MLB, hockey, you have to prepare while you're playing, while you still have notoriety, because by the time you get out, that door is shut. There's somebody new, somebody, it's like a new car coming in. You know, there's somebody new coming in, and and um, by that time, it's too late, man. Right, right. And especially, you know, going against the likes of someone like Stephen A., you know, who I've, I've had the <laughs> pleasure to watch you two battle it out on uh, on TV plenty of times. And, um, you know, you got to be able to hold your own. So that that's great. Now, a little bit more of a, a touchy topic with what's going on in, in our nation right now, you know, and in regards to the NFL, NFL players have – finally spoken up, you know, um, against social injustice. And they've asked, well, they've demanded, you know, that the league and the commissioner apologize for denouncing, you know, kneeling uh, amongst other forms of protest. Um, but do you feel like with Colin Kaepernick being the, the lead in that protest, do you feel like the NFL dropped the ball by not apologizing, specifically Commissioner Goodell? Uh, absolutely. I mean, listen, I think, you know, everyone everyone that revisits what Colin Kaepernick, you know, when he started his protest and what it was all about, I mean, it, it really came to fruition this year. I mean, we've how many, in, how many instances that have we seen, you know, from Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, you know, just, you know, George Floyd. We've seen it time and time again just this year in 2020. Right. So, you know, and the league is, listen, and one thing about the NFL, they are a PR machine. Like, they have a, re they have a really good sense of where the tide is, is where the winds are blowing. Um, so, basically, the players see that, too. So, when the players made that video where it was Patrick Mahomes, Michael Thomas, basically all the stars in the National Football League made that, that, um, that video to the NFL and Roger Goodell, it really put the NFL on their heels and – it forced the NFL's hand to really step up to the plate. And I think for Colin Kaepernick, Roger Goodell dropped the ball in mentioning his name because we all see what happened, what's happened to Colin Kaepernick. He's been blackballed. Right. Um, 
you know, for three years now. There's no reason that Colin Kaepernick should not be on the NFL roster playing in the National Football League. But clearly, uh, the league and, and Roger Goodell dropped the ball. And I think a lot of players right now want Colin Kaepernick on a roster. Yes, it's nice that the NFL is, you know, committing $250 million over 10 years. But until they do right by Colin Kaepernick and, and, and somebody signing him, this, this is not going to go away. Yeah, I agree. I think there will always be that asterisk uh, behind any of the NFL's efforts as long as Colin Kaepernick's not signed. And, you know, because Colin Kaeper Kaepernick has done what he has done thus far, um, how do you feel that has played an impact on other players? I mean, do you believe that, that it has kind of caused some, some pressure for them to also speak up? Well, listen, I think, you know, the, the, the thing that makes Colin Kaepernick's situation uh, unique is he took a stand on, on he took a stand on, on police brutality and, and social injustice when there was a lot of when there was a lot of, uh, pr you know, a lot of pressure going against him. It basically cost him his career, you know, by the fact that he's been blackballed for, for three years. But if you look out, if you look at throughout history where athletes have done these type of things, have had protests. A lot of them had paid for it through their careers. You know, John Carlos, you know, I could go, you know, the list goes on and on. We see Muhammad Ali you know, lost his title, lost his belt, you know, because he protested against the Vietnam War. So, you know, with Colin Kaepernick, man, um, you know, it definitely cost him three years of his career. But he's ultimately winning. He's winning the PR battle because now it, with everything that's going on in 2020, these guys have stepped up to the plate and put a lot of pressure on the National Football League. And, and so uh, when, when we go back and look at the history of Colin Kaepernick, it's going to look pretty damn good for him, I can tell you that. There we go. I love it. Now, with, with that, you know, we've also seen other sports kind of chime in. And, you know, players also spoke um, uh, with, um, with regards to Colin Kaepernick and protests against police brutality and social injustice. We've seen the likes of the players in the NBA who are preparing, or at least we think, um, to come back in July to start up the 2020 season. And, um, you know, there's some players that have been opposed to it. How do you feel about, you know, them being opposed and also, you know, maybe not only about um, fighting social injustice, but also because of the worry with COVID-19? Yeah, man, this is um th this this is unlike anything that this is unlike anything we've seen, you know, with the fact that we're dealing with you know, like you said, COVID nineteen. They're going to have to be in a bubble, um, with their families, isolated from everyone, um, with all the protests still going on, nationwide and worldwide, uh, over Black Lives Matter. Um, but I would say that I would encourage the players to play. And the reason why I say that is for a couple reasons. One, the economic um, impact, if they weren't to play, will be catastrophic for their league. I mean, you're talking about billions and billions of dollars that will be lost revenue uh, for the players. And so if you're a player, that's money that you can help inject into the movement. Money that you can help inject into your community to create change within your community. Don't flush that money. Don't flush that money down the toilet. Use that money. Use that money because that's a resource that can benefit the greater good for everyone. And then obviously, I would say the biggest thing is just the platform. Mm -hmm. if, the, if the 2020 season is going to be played, they're going to have a huge media platform. And I get, I understand that they'll be on lockdown. Maybe they won't be able to, you know, join in the protests that are still going on around the country. But they'll still have media media partners that'll still be able to project their messages to the masses. So right. don't underestimate the fact that you, as a player in the NBA, have a huge platform that you still can utilize, you know, whether it be the, the, the end of the regular season or during the, you know, more importantly, during the playoffs. So I would encourage these guys to, you know, jump back into the, you know, to restart the league and use the capital and the media, your media partners, to really continue to to, um, to project that message out. Right. Great. Great. That I think I think you hit it right there on the nail. Um, 
Now I have to ask you, you know, this is a little bit more personal as I'm a black man like you um, with children. And I know there are many, there are many around, you know, the nation that, that have to live with this um, idea of how to navigate around teaching their children how to live uh, through this, this climate. Is that some type, do you feel pressure to have to teach your kids um, about what's going on within the nation? Oh, absolutely. I've always said, you know, as a parent that you are, you are your, ultimately you are responsible for your kids' education. Too many times we see, you know, parents relegate that job to teachers or whoever is in the school system. But ultimately as parents, it's our job to teach our kids. Right. You know what 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 the truth really is, and so for me, you know, I'll, my wife and I, we have seven kids, and we have a range from, we have adult kids that are you know that are in college all the way down to eight, and so when they watch TV and they're seeing all the you know events that are happening, you know, we sit down and talk to them and and let them know what's going on, what's exactly happening, um, how we see it, and not only that, but to teach them, especially we you know we have. about their business, you know, as, they, as they're as they out here in, in the public, how you should carry yourself. You know, I think things that probably all black men and, and just black people in general have had to deal with out here as far as, te you know, teaching their kids and, and, and so on and so forth. So absolutely, man, we definitely got to educate and I'm definitely doing it in my house. That's amazing. Likewise, you know, it's uh, a little bit of a challenge, you know, finding the right words to uh, teach my five-year-old girls um, about what's going on. But, you know, my wife and I, we really, you know, try our best to, to break it down so that they can understand it and, you know, hopefully continue to learn that as they grow. Um, now, because of the tough times, what are some words of encouragement that you could give us right now? Well, listen, I think that, I think that we're in um... – we're in uncharted territory, uh, and I think a lot of people out here are, are uncomfortable, which is the, that is great because guess what? Change happens when people are uncomfortable. That's right. So what I would say to everyone is strategize, organize, strategize, and then execute. Where that, now is like the perfect time. With everything being in flux the way it is, this is the perfect time for change. It could be changed on a personal level. There's going to be change, I think, as a country. I think there's a reckoning going on. So for all, for all the people out there, this is your chance to really get yourself together and go out here and execute, strategize and execute. Maybe there are things that you've been wanting to do that you've been putting on that right now is the time. Right. If you wanted to volunteer, if you wanted to start a nonprofit, you wanted to get into, you know, want to be an entrepreneur, whatever the case may be, now is the time because there's so much going on. There's so many things in flux. This is when, this is the time when you got to take it, take advantage of this opportunity. There we go. That's right. Now uh, we'll kind of bring it back, uh, you know, on a little bit of a lighter topic, but I just want to hit you with a couple rapid fire questions. Um, if that's all right. So uh, let's go for it. All right. So first question, who was the toughest defender that you had to block? Oh, man. Um, I would probably have to say Warren Sapp. Uh, okay. You know, I faced, I faced Warren Sapp like my, my third year in the league, man. And that dude was – he was amazing. Quick, big, strong, everything. He was, he was amazing, man. So I would probably say Warren Sapp. All right. Now, I, I know that you've been uh, doing some pretty heavy exercising and uh, working out during this quarantine, um, but do you have any guilty treats or pleasures that you, you know, that you like to indulge in from time to time? Yeah, man. I, I, listen, I, I'm the type of guy, I have a sweet tooth. I, I love sweets. And so for me, it's, you know, whether it's candy or, you know, cakes or anything like that, man, I, I love I love sweets, man. But you know, I've been really doing a really good job of kind of, um, you know, keeping that to a minimum, man. And for me, 
you know, I've lost 50 pounds since March 23rd, man. So, you know, I'm just trying to stay disciplined and stay on a straight and narrow. Good. Nice. That, that, that's awesome. I know it's, it's hard when you got temptation of the crafty table over there at work <laughs> and things like that. So uh, keep up the great work. Now, um, before I ask this last question, um, I do want to open it up to the viewers. If you have any questions, we may take a couple and, um, you know, see if, if Damien can, can answer a few of those for us. Um, but with this last question, I know it's very early. The season hasn't started. But if you could pick two Super Bowl contenders right now, who would they be? Well, listen, I think um, because of this whole COVID-19 and how it's affected the offseason, I tend to go with teams that, you know, they, you know, they got continuity, same, same coach, quarterback, same player. So, for me, I'm going with the Kansas City Chiefs again because they got the best quarterback in the league in Patrick Mahomes, and that's no disrespect to Lamar Jackson. Um, and then I'll probably go – I'm probably going to go – I'm going to go with the New Orleans Saints. Ooh, okay. I'm going to go with New Orleans. You know, Sean Payton, Drew Brees. This kind of feels like the last hurrah mm -hmm. for New Orleans Saints. You know, Drew Brees is, what, 41, 41, 42 years old. I feel like this might be his last year to try to get to the Super Bowl. So I'm going to go with Kansas City versus New Orleans. Okay. Now, that I think those are some great picks. I mean, New Orleans has been in it. Uh, you know, the last few seasons up until, you know, the divisional or the, the NFC championship and, uh, you know, had some heartbreaks. Um, and obviously Kansas City got it done last year. Now, what about uh, your guy, the GOAT, uh, TB12 over there in Tampa Bay? Do you think they're going to be some type of contender? Yeah, I think they're going to be right in the mix. You know, obviously they're playing the same division as the New Orleans Saints. Um, I, I, think, I think Tom Brady is going to have a hell of a year this year. Uh, with the weapons that they have in Tampa, he hasn't had these type of weapons ever in his whole career. Yeah. Um, so I, I think the only reason I'm picking the New Orleans Saints over Tampa Bay is because, again, the way this whole offseason has been, I'm going to give the edge to the team that, that's been together for a while and have that, that continuity. So I'm going to give the edge to, to the Saints, but it's going, to be a, it's going to be a close battle between the Saints and the Bucks. Okay, that's, that's fair. Now, uh, looking at a couple of these questions over here, um, I see one. It says, who's going to win the MVP this season? I got a surprise pick for y'all. I'm going with Kyler Murray of the Arizona Cardinals. Wow. I'm going with Kyler Murray of the Arizona Cardinals. I think he – Kyler Murray, I know a lot of people probably didn't watch the Arizona Cardinals last year. He got better and better and better as the season went on. And I always watch for one thing. I watch the teams that finish on a high note, players that finish on a high note, and the fact that he's in the same system, and they traded for DeAndre Hopkins, who's one of the top two receivers in the game. So he's in a system that he's been in, he's been playing in for years, going back to college. Mm -hmm. And now you got Larry Fitzgerald, you got DeAndre Hopkins, Christian Kirk. I mean, they got a bunch of playmakers on offense. So I'm going Kyler Murray as as the as the the sleeper to win the MVP this year. Okay, yeah, that, I think that surprised a lot of folks. Uh, you know, just because, like you said, it, it's kind of hard to keep up with some of the teams that aren't doing well the season before, um, but we watch that momentum. It, it does carry over a lot of times to the next season, and adding those weapons like, like D-Hop, it's a huge piece. That, that can really take them over the top. Um, and then I'll give you one more question. Uh, we got, will Jimmy G, is Jimmy G a top 10 quarterback in the league right now? Wow. No, he's not a top 10 quarterback right now. Okay. I like Jimmy G's game, but he's not a top 10 quarterback. I think, you know, if you watch the Super Bowl, you know, top 10 quarterback at the end, at the end of that game, some of the plays that he missed, right. You 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 have to make those plays. Yeah. You have to make those plays. So, 
like I said, I like Jimmy G. I think he's going to get better this year. Every year that you're removed from that ACL, you tend to get better. But right now, I would say, no, he's not a top 10 quarterback. Okay. Good, good. Yeah, I think, um, you know, they still – they the Niners have a lot of work to do. Um, but with the weapons that they have, they probably – you know, we'll see. They, they'll still be a contender, I'm sure. We'll see yeah, how they're going to be right – um, they're gonna be they're gonna be right there. They're gonna be in the mix too. They they got a strong team. Yeah, yeah. That NFC West is gonna be real challenging for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Mr. Damian Woody, on behalf of Black Solutions and the Black Inspirational Spotlight, I want to thank you for taking the time out for us. And um, uh oh, hold on. Before I before I end it, I got I got one more question for you. Since we're doing this quarterback talk, let me see. Now to okay. ask. Is Dak a top ten quarterback? <laughs> how did I know? How did I know a Cowboys question was going to come in? <laughs> it's um, inevitable, right? Actually, yeah, before, yeah. Before you answer that, Damien, can we can we mesh this question? Is Dak a top ten quarterback, and does he deserve forty million? Dak is a top ten quarterback. Yes, okay. and what and what I'll say about does he deserve 40, 40 million a year? You deserve whatever the market tells you um, that's gonna that's gonna pay you. There you know, go. people get it people get it twisted and think that well this player shouldn't get it, but that's not how it works. It goes it goes with the market. Whatever the market pays you, that's what you deserve. Right. Period. That's how right. sports works. It's a it's a it's a business, right? At the end of the it's, day, it's a business, and we it's all supply know, and demand. We all we all know that uh. As soon as um Mr. Patrick Mahomes gets paid, that market is going to shoot right up, right? Oh, listen, when 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 I, I I actually think that if Dak had his way, he would rather wait until Patrick Mahomes gets paid. Yeah, because Patrick Mahomes is going to blow the blow the roof off of the this whole thing. Right? I can definitely I can see him getting a forty five million per year type of deal. Yeah, that I mean you know. Well deserved, definitely, and you know I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, these, these agents, you know, they know how to play the game, and, and they're probably you know telling Dak, "Hey, hang in there, maybe sign this franchise tag, and, and you know we'll see what happens. Play on it. We'll see what happens <laughs> next season. You know, and get you some money. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a pleasure. Um, like I said, on behalf of Black Solutions, we want to thank you for taking the time out to speak with us. And, um, you know, I just want to wish you an early Happy Father's Day and hope you and your family stay safe throughout all these, these times. Oh, man, well, I appreciate you having me on, man. And same to you. Happy Father's Day to you. And, again, I'll tell, it, I'll tell everyone out there, now is the time. Strategize, organize, and execute. Go get it. That's right. There we go. We keep fighting. All right. Thank you. All right now. Yep.